Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast, where we go deep on the sport of gravel cycling through in-depth interviews with product designers, event organizers, and athletes who are pioneering the sport. I'm your host, Craig Dalton, a lifelong cyclist who discovered gravel cycling back in 2016 and made all the mistakes you don't need to make. I approach each episode as a beginner to unlock all the knowledge you need to become a great gravel cyclist. This week on the podcast, I'm super stoked to invite back Amanda Nauman. Amanda is a big time friend of the pod, a podcaster herself as the co-host of the Grodio podcast, a very accomplished off-road athlete with notable wins twice at Unbound 200, five times at the Rock Cobbler. We touch on Rock Cobbler this year and some of the help she provided Sam Ames with inviting and encouraging more female athletes to toe the line at this year's Rock Cobbler event. She and Dave Sheik are also the co-founders of the Mammoth Tough event in Mammoth, California, which occurs in September each year. She's a member of the Gravel Cycling Hall of Fame Advisory Board, and according to her, she's Walter the Dog's favorite. I'm not going to get into that domestic squabble, but we'll leave it at that. I'm excited to bring you a follow-up conversation with our friend, Amanda Nauman. Hi, Craig. How are you? I am doing great. It's so good to see you. Yeah, likewise. I'm excited. What, almost two and a half years later? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing about our first recording I was recalling, we were doing an Instagram live at the same time. It was back when everybody was trying to figure out Instagram live. So we were doing that and recording our conversation. And I ultimately posted it to the podcast feed. (laughs) Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what am I sort of, I would say it was a failed endeavor into Instagram live. It's not something I, I jam on. I'm much more comfortable in the podcast format where I can just talk to people and publish it later. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's hard and distracting. You get all the messages. You're like, what, what is that question? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have so much ground to cover. We were chatting a little bit offline, but I, I thought what would be an interesting place to start knowing you participated in the lifetime grand prix in, in 2022. 2022. I just wanted to get your kind of overall perceptions as someone who's been around gravel racing for many years with that structure of your season infused onto your life. How, how did it go? And what were your thoughts on the, the Lifetime Grand Prix in general? Yeah, I signed up probably on the last day that was possible to turn in the applications that um, winter before because I really contemplated whether or not it was something that I wanted to do for a while. Cause I knew, you know, I had done unbound Excel. They had put Leadville on the list for the grand prix. And I was like, man, I've always wanted to do Leadville. I can kind of shape my calendar around the rest of the series as well. So ultimately I decided to sign up for it knowing, you know, it's kind of a shoe into Leadville, which is one thing I had always wanted to do. And at the same time I get to do some gravel and some other mountain bike races that I hadn't necessarily done before. So I was very optimistic and excited about the Grand Prix last year. It didn't necessarily go how I had planned or anticipated, but uh, yeah, I think what they have created in the series and the opportunities for athletes to go race that, I think it's a great a great thing and great structure for a lot of people, but it wasn't necessarily, let's say, the right fit for me last year. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, just for the listener's sake, like if you go back a few years before that, as a gravel racer, how would you go about picking your calendar? Yeah, I mean, there's just some of the marquee events that I would have picked, you know, in 2019, like for sure, Rock Cobbler, Mid-South, Belgian Waffle Ride, San Diego, and then you'd go into Unbound. Like for, I think, a California racer, that was sort of the way you would go. And then as summer happened, you know, you could pick and choose events, SBT, I think, was was happening at that time so it was a good summer one gravel worlds and then rpi was kind of sort of a season ender a little bit before you hit fall and some people would race cyclocross and whatnot so that was kind of the loose structure i think at least in 2019 and then 2020 2021 everything kind of changed and there was a big reevaluation of what was important in terms of picking events going to events or not (laughs) and then yeah in 2022 everybody had the opportunity to apply for the grand prix so that changed things but beforehand it was sort of what events were some of the big names going to which ones had the most prestige and 
And if you were looking for sponsorship and stuff, you wanted to make sure you were at an event where there's enough competition there to show that, let's say, your results are are worth noting. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's so interesting to think like think of it from the professional athlete's perspective, going back prior to the existence of the Grand Prix, just the flexibility to kind of go do whatever you wanted and whatever was exciting to you. And then to see athletes be forced, because as you said, it's an amazing opportunity. And I think the Grand Prix fits so many people's needs right now. It does exclude certain events and it certainly does drive your calendar. And just looking at it from the outside and maybe talking to a few athletes along the way, there's definitely an increased stress when you've you've got this season long endeavor that you're pursuing and you're trying to get points at every stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that was where it caused me some stress last year because I got sick a couple of times and the kind of sick where had it been a normal year, I just would have like pulled the plug and not gone to Sea Otter, for example, because that was the first one that I was sick for. And in hindsight, like I probably should have done that. But when you're in the moment, you're like, no, I can't skip this because I only have one scratch race. I had to skip Schwamigan because of Mammoth. So I was already in a tough situation of like, I have to do all of these other ones no matter what. And that was the stress for me, I think, was feeling like I had to do this thing. And especially because last year we paid for it. So I was also like financially invested in the decision that I had made. Um, so yeah, for me, like I said, that that feeling wasn't perfect for me because bike racing isn't my only source of income. So it, I've always tried to go towards what I'm doing has to be fun because if not, then like, what's the point? It's not like the money puts food on the table for me. So I have that ability to say, hey, I need to pick and choose things that are important to me. And I think I've come back a little bit more to that uh, in 2023, which I would say I was at in 2019 for sure. Um, And then a period of like a few years floundering of what what was important for me. (laughs) (laughs) I know you guys at the Grodio podcast did a really great episode with, I think it was Michelle Duffy talking, just talking about your, how you felt the season went at the Lifetime Grand Prix and some suggestions and some questions. What were some of the key takeaways if you look back on that season to say, like, what would you recommend they changed in that program? And did they ultimately end up doing that for 23? Yeah, I definitely, I asked some hard questions. I think I told Kimo I was going to ask some hard questions and he was like, yeah, okay. (laughs) But I, you know, I pulled some of them from like actual trolls on the internet that would say like these most outlandish things. And you're like, really? Like, did you even pay attention at all? But I wanted to give them the opportunity to respond to some of that stuff. Like, like did social media matter or you know, how could you charge everyone money and all the entry fees to go do this stuff and kind of pinpoint some of the things that people had complained about, I would say. Um, And yeah, they changed a lot. I mean, at that time, they had already made 2023, like no fees, so people don't have to pay for the entry fees. Um, And I think they're doing a much better job with social media. And that was one of my major points that I wanted to drive with them was like, the stuff that I was seeing, they had relied so heavily on the flow bikes deal that they had made and doing that live coverage and really just making sure that flow was going to do the storytelling for them. And it just never happened. And that was my, my main frustration is in March, like before we went to mid South flow did one-on-one interviews with probably everyone. And they had all this great content that they put out before sea otter And it was very in-depth and it felt like everybody was telling their story and it was fun to follow that part of it. And then after Unbound, it just stopped. And then they had the issues in Utah. And so ultimately for somebody like me, where being in the top 10 wasn't necessarily realistic and being in that midfield to back of the pack zone, I kept saying like, what is the point for somebody like me and somebody, and now let's say somebody in the 20 to 30 range What's the point of being in it if you're not giving me the exposure that I want if I'm going to be in the series and like invest in this with you? And so I hope that that's the biggest thing that they change for this year is not relying on the flow stuff, probably expanding the storytelling to more than the top five at each event yeah. and and being able to tell more of the story of everyone, I guess. Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I sort of... 
when I look through the list of writers, both male and female, and I think about like, who, oh, who might I interview over the cross of the season? As you know, this isn't specifically a racing podcast, yeah. but even if it was like, I can't get to all those athletes and it's almost like I just need to get a dartboard, just throw a dart and pick someone that I don't know and interview, because I think you're right. There's interesting stories across the board and the more that they can kind of create those personal connections with the athletes, the more excited people are going to be to follow. Yeah, for sure. And I think like Kimo said, his major goal was to get non-endemic sponsorship into the sport and to get these athletes able to make a living off of it. Like those were his two main goals in making this series. And I was like, okay, if you do that, like you need to work more on the marketing side of it and you need to tell all of the stories because if we're just going to talk about the top five and we're only going to pay the top 10, then what's the point of going 30 deep? (laughs) So (laughs) yeah, like that's, I think, I think they get that now and they'll probably work more on that this year, but for sure. Like I'm, I'm going to have Anna Yamauchi on Grodio next and she just won rock cobbler and she's doing the grand prix. And she's one of those like up and coming names where it's a really exciting story to follow And if they go the same route they did as last year, which is like, well, let's just focus on the top five hopefuls at each event. Like she's never going to get any coverage then. (laughs) So yeah, if they can expand the way that they tell those stories, I think that would be great. Yeah. Similarly, I just launched an episode with uh, Ian Lopez de San Ramon, 19 year old out of Northern California. who's He's the youngest person who's part of the series. Yeah. And it's, I think it's just going to be an interesting timestamp for he and I to like, look at this interview, where he's at, what he's thinking about with his career in cycling and yeah. follow him throughout the year. Yeah. I love that stuff. I love it. Yeah. So did you decide to, to throw your hat in the ring for 2023 in the Grand Prix? I did not. And mostly because I think of the experiences that I had in 2022 and not enjoying that stuck feeling. Um, if they had another deal or contract or if they had presented a way that they were going to do marketing for all of the athletes I might have reconsidered it but because we were just going blindly on the hope of like yeah we're going to make it better than the year before I was like well I'd rather focus on more of the stuff I think that I want to do personally um so yeah I'm I'm optimistic about the things that they do change for this year I just think it would have been cool for them to maybe present that up front When you saw the Call of a Lifetime series on YouTube, did that make you think they might be approaching it differently? Or what were your thoughts of that series? Yeah, I I loved it. I think they, you know, they had told us initially that it was going to happen. And before every race weekend, they had said, hey, if you're in the top three men or women, because they alternated genders throughout the, the series, they told us all of that up front. And they said, if you are going to be in this top group, please make sure you make time for the interviews and all of that. So that part of it we knew was for sure happening. And they made some of the vignette videos highlighting some of the athletes, but it just wasn't, it wasn't everyone and it wasn't clear how they were picking the stories to tell essentially. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think they did a really good job with the series though. I, I joked that it's like, They said, make it like Drive to Survive with a little less drama, but and a lot more cool bike racing. I think they nailed it pretty good. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. Yeah. With with the idea that you can drop two races and now it's up to seven races, do you think that would meaningfully change like what your experience would have been if that was the scenario last year? Yeah, it would have eliminated some of that stress of feeling stuck or knowing that you had a little bit more flexibility. Uh, yeah, I think that, that that format will be healthier for people. And I think that is for sure something that they realized last year with some of the injuries that happened already, like Pete racing through when maybe he shouldn't have with his hand still hurting and pacing. So um, yeah, just lessons learned, growing pains of how you set up a series from the get-go. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting. I th- also think it'll be interesting if someone is riding through the series healthy and just decides not to do something, you know, unbound, obviously being a huge effort that maybe some people might not be suited for. At least that was the speculation last year. Yeah. Um, Wondering like whether they'll just opt out of one and save one in their pocket for either a bad day or an illness or injury. Yeah. Everybody was afraid of that. And I felt like there were a lot of rumblings of like, oh, so-and-so is going to skip unbound because they can. 
But I think peer pressure might have just went on that, and most of them ended up just doing it. So maybe that'll keep happening. I think everybody kind of feels that is the marquee one, and if you skip it because it doesn't suit you and you won people will probably be like well they didn't do unbound so <laughs> yeah i could yeah. see that yeah little, a- little asterisk by exactly their name. <laughs> exactly uh well they chickened out on that one <laughs> <laughs> love it so what what are some of your plans for 2023 obviously like over the last couple of years you've uh, become an event organizer with mammoth tough which we'll get into also started dabbling in gravel camps, which sound amazing, but why don't you just, let's talk through what 2023 is going to look like for you for both a racing and other gravel endeavor perspective. Yeah. I, yeah, quite, quite a few people have asked me this and I think it's important to also remind people again that like, this isn't my job per se, you know, like I have a regular desk job. And so the way that I've approached anything has always been fun first and doing things that I want to do. Um, and last year my dad got sick a couple times and the business that I work for is my parents own it. And so, and it's just me and my brother that work for them. So I think we kind of had this like revelation of all of this other stuff that we're doing isn't quite as important and putting my dad's health first and focusing on that kind of was, and it's one of those things where it puts stuff into perspective and I'm like, yeah, I've been doing this bike racing stuff for a decade. It is it has been a very selfish endeavor and there are kind of other things in my life that I would like to focus on. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's the background to all of it. Essentially, you know, it's not as easy of a decision as like, Oh, I'd rather race mid South and unbound. Like it was, it was never really that simple for me for 2023. It was kind of more like mammoth is very important to me. Doing camps is very important to me. Having more time at work is also important to me. And, um, going back to the goal that I had in 2020 of finishing the Caldera 500 was also a goal and something I wanted to do last year. But like I said, the like shiny object of the Grand Prix got in the way and I was like, well, I could do this thing. So I just put that on hold for another year. Um, So I'd like to, to go back to that and try and finish it. Awesome. Can you describe that, that attempt at Caldera and what that is? Yeah. So it is the Caldera 500, Um, the person who started it, his name is Alan Jacoby and he lives in Idaho now, so he doesn't live in Mammoth anymore, but he was a big tour divide fanatic. Um, and he came back to Mammoth after doing tour divide and was like, I need to do something similar here in my backyard. So he came up with Caldera, which is 150, 250 North and South loops. And then the Caldera 500, which is the big Mamma Jamma one. And most all of this is like an Excel spreadsheet of maps and cues and like very rudimentary stuff that I think over the course of the next year or so, it will be a little bit more updated ever since um, one of the bikepacking.com people did a feature story on it because he finished the 500 last fall. So with more attention, more eyeballs, I think it's going to gain popularity, but Essentially, they're just like really stupid, hard bike packing routes in the area. And I think the fastest time on the 500 is just under five days. So it's not really something that can be done in a couple. And it's more walking than you think. And it's uh, a lot harder just because of the elevation and the massive climbs in the Eastern Sierra. So yeah, that's that's the backstory. There's a cool video that Niner put out in 2020 when I had first started it and kind of the goal of finishing it has, is still, is still there looming over my head. I've had a couple of attempts that didn't go right. <laughs> <laughs> and is it the type of thing now that in the bike packing community, it's this known entity and people are starting to sort of check it off their list and make attempts to go at it fast? Barely. That's why I said, like, I think it'll gain popularity now that bikepacking.com did a feature on it because I think there are only five or six guys that have ever finished the 500. I'm the only person to ever finish the 150 South Loop. Um, Yeah, so it's very, very grassroots. I mean, there are probably like 200 people on the Facebook group that know about it. Um, But yeah, if you are interested, there is a Facebook group. It is private, so you can just request access for it for anybody listening. But yeah, I would love to see it blow up. Like I think it's a it's a really beautiful route. It's very challenging and hard, but if you're looking for a good reason to to get away, it's a it's a good one. 
how did you fall in love with that area in the Eastern Sierra? Uh, growing up, I think, um, yeah, we probably talked about this a few years ago, but my parents always took us to Mammoth growing up and same thing with David's parents. And so we both sort of fell in love with it in a parallel way as we were younger. And then once we met, um, we were like, oh man, this place is awesome. And my parents saved up enough money to get a house there, I think in 2015 or 16, I think. And because of that opportunity to be there and stay there, I ended up doing a lot of my training for, at the time, DK, now Unbound. And so I attribute a lot of the success I had winning in 15 and 16 to training up there because it was just the most like wide open not California, like in the way that you would think about California gravel. It was just more Midwest than anything I'd ever found in the state. And because of that, it gave me the opportunity to put my head down and go hard the way that you would in the, in the back roads of Kansas. <laughs> so that was sort of how we fell in love with it. Definitely skiing and snowboarding first, then mountain biking over the years. And then, hey, like, let's go down this road that looks like it goes off to nowhere. And yeah. Love it. And then which year was the, was 2020 was the first year that you guys attempted to put on Mammoth Tough, right? Right. Yeah. We came up with the idea in like, well, I'd say late 2018 or so. Um, I don't know if I've ever told this story publicly, but we actually went maybe half a year of doing it with Lifetime and thinking it was going to be a Lifetime event. And ultimately Dave and I decided we wanted to do it on our own. And so in 20 late 2019, we were like, okay, we're going to do it ourselves because this is how we want to do it and present it. And, and then with the intention of it kicking off in 2020. And what year did it actually kick off? Yeah. <laughs> last year. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. yeah. I yeah. couldn't remember if it happened once or twice already. Yeah. So no, you got, was... got one under your belt. Yeah. COVID and then 2021 was wildfires, unfortunately. And then yeah, 2022 finally happened last year, which one thing I do want to mention, I just set up Bike Reg for this in 2023 for Mammoth Tough, and they have a new insurance policy option for their event promoters where there's like a natural disaster thing. You can pay a fee into this insurance thing where they will cover refunds for natural disasters like wildfires, which is huge, especially so any promoters listening in California think about it. It's only like 2.2% of your fees or whatever. And I think the state that we're in and with, you know, some of the things that could happen in our areas, like that is a, a pretty good opportunity for promoters. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it. So yeah. the events in September, so end of the year, each, each season. Yes. Yeah. It is the weekend after Labor Day. So traditionally, the Mammoth Grand Fondo has Labor Day weekend, and then we are that next Saturday after that, which is the closing weekend of the mountain bike park. So we had a lot of people that were up there, you know, you have siblings or other family members that want to just go ride park all day, and you can go do your little gravel adventure. Nice. A little, I'd, I'd do a little bit of both if given yeah. the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people went and rode mountain bikes on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and tell us a little bit about the event. Like if someone's considering it for their calendar, what, what is it like? Obviously Mammoth Mountain is at a high elevation as you referenced before, but how did you design the, the, the event? What are the, the roads and trails like up there? Yeah, it's one thing. So when we first started it, we had a short course and a long course. We were going to do a 40 mile and a hundred mile option ish. And then in 2021, one, we had a bunch of people come out and we tested sort of a medium route, even though the event was canceled. We were like, hey, go ride part of this and tell us what you think. And that was the genesis of the medium distance. So in 2022, last year, we had three routes, even though that was never the initial plan. But some people felt like, oh, the short one's too easy and the long one's too hard. So we need an in-between. And that was where we came up with the idea of doing three different ones. And they're very different like they're in completely different sections of the of the valley of the mountain they go in different areas so I wanted to be able to sell a different experience for each distance and sort of have it as a stepping stone leading up to challenging yourself over 100 if you want to and letting those first two on the way kind of get you ready for what to expect for the for the long one because the long one 
you go pretty much all the way to Bishop and back essentially is the route. Yeah. And how much climbing is in the long one? 7,500 or so. It's not too bad. It's not like Rock Cobbler where it's 100 feet per every mile. It's a little bit less than that. So I think it's um, it's not as like punchy and brutal in that regard. <laughs> yeah. Are you doing sort of long duration climbs on the course or is it rolling? Yeah, it's mostly you just like kind of get in the zone and climb for good chunks of time it's a lot less like five minutes as hard as you can go you're kind of like yeah. all right kick it into gear for the next hour essentially <laughs> <laughs> nice and then the the um the the short and the medium courses what are those distances yeah the short is about 40 miles very palatable you go by uh the the hot creek area which is cool so you can stop and go down there and then the medium distance is about 75 miles or so and it has some pretty technical descending in it, I would say. And for folks who aren't used to riding or navigating sand as much, that feeling of like riding in pumice stone is very different from anything else in the state, essentially, because you're just riding in old lava fields. So it's very unique. So I had a lot of people tell me last year, like, oh, man, you weren't kidding me. You said it was gonna be hard. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like some like silly marketing ploy to be like, this is gonna be the hardest event ever. I was like, I was serious. Like, it's not easy. Um, and so it was it was funny to have a bunch of people come up to me afterwards and being like, yeah, you were right. I'm like, I know, I, I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> what does that end up translating wise for equipment? Like, what do you sort of recommend people ride up there? Yeah, 40 minimum tire width. And I tell people, like, go with as wide as your frame would allow, essentially. So, like, I could fit a 48 Oracle Ridge on my RLT if I if I needed to. And I think that would be the most fun, realistically, for the day if you were just looking to have a good time. And a lot of it is because some of the softer stuff, if you're not used to the, like, fish taily feeling of your bike with when it has two narrow tires and sand then go wider because you, it'll be more stable and a lot less like wiggly, I guess. So it kind of depends on number one, people's handling abilities and number two, what your frame can allow. And then, yeah, just go big, it's safer. <laughs> Did people listen to you or were people showing up on 32s? Yeah, no, people listened. I think that was, <laughs> that was the thing we tried to scare everyone with. I was like, if you go under 40, you're not going to have a good time. Just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So overall, how was the first year of the event? Did it meet your expectations? Yeah, yeah, it was it was great. I think the one thing I don't like gloating, but I will toot my horn on the safety aspect because the one thing about that area is there's you have very little cell service. You're kind of really truly in the middle of nowhere and the only people who ever go out there are just going in their side-by-sides or motorcycles to to get away. So we made it an, an emphasis on safety and having 100% rider accountability, which you'd be surprised looking into events that you're trying to sign up for that that's not really the case for most events that you go to. Promoters kind of put it on you to, oh, well, if you're out there, you're kind of on your own. And if you don't get back, like and you tried calling SAG, whatever, like you'll figure out how to get back essentially. And there's not really making sure that everybody is back okay whereas in our case if you get out there and you get lost or can't find your way back like there's a like you go into the risk of like making it out alive essentially because temperatures can drop overnight and there's kind of more risk factors involved so we wanted to make sure that we knew where everyone was and TVG timing had a really good setup where you could text them if you DNF'd, if you got back to your hotel room on your own. And then if you got picked up by people, obviously we knew where you were, but we got that idea from, there's a there's an ultra, a Bishop ultra that happens in May every year. And they have a policy where if you don't report your DNF or like that you left the course and just went home, you're never allowed back. <laughs> like they have a very like hard stance on that and they just don't want people back that disregard that rule. So we are like, well, we don't want to be that strict, but we want to make sure people know that we care about where they are out there. Um, so yeah, safety, I think was, was the biggest thing that we wanted to, to shoot for. And hopefully 
everybody's told me like, you're never going to be able to scale that if you have 2000 people. And I don't know, I'd like to take on that challenge just because I think making sure everyone's safe is, is always going to be our biggest priority. Yeah, for sure. That sounds great. I remember in the first year you guys were advertising that it was kind of co-located alongside Oktoberfest in Mammoth. Did that turn out to be the case? It didn't. They uh, they ended up canceling their festival. They like I, COVID stuff and the people who ran Oktoberfest have other businesses in town that they were kind of more worried about than than putting on the festival last year. So they canceled. And so that is why we did our own beer run on Friday. So we ended up doing what used to be theirs. They handed it off to us and they're like, yeah, if you want to do this stupid beer run, go for it, which we did because I had done it the year before. And I was like, this is awesome. Um, so we took that over and, and we obviously last year didn't have time to like throw together a full on music festival like they had had in the past, but because they canceled sort of last minute. So this year the village is kind of helping us get talent involved for kind of having it be a little bit more of a festival and live music and entertainment for Saturday. Um, so yeah, no more Oktoberfest, but, but we're trying to make the party. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, now I know you guys have been through the ringer as far as event organizers are concerned between the pandemic and the fires, but let's put those two years of waiting aside. Like, how would you, what's your, how do you think about the amount of effort required to put on Mammoth Tough? And was it a satisfying enterprise for you guys to put together or was being an event organizer just like this crazy amount of work you never anticipated? It was a crazy amount of work I never anticipated, 100%. Um, I think that Sunday after the award ceremony when we were all cleaning up, I was like, somebody asked David, like, oh, are you guys going to do this next year? And David was like, uh, I don't know. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so we had very different, I think, immediate reactions to it. Um, David ended up doing a lot more of like the manual labor, I would say. And I did a lot more of like the computer work and logistics and all of that. So we came at it from different perspectives. But in, even though it was more work than we had anticipated, I would say it was a lot more rewarding than we had anticipated as well. Because I have always told the story that Mammoth was like the special place to us, like so much so that we thought about just keeping it a secret and not really like displaying it as this gravel destination, I guess you could say. But doing that and having the opportunity to share this place that has meant so much to us, I think was ultimately the biggest gift and the thing that we were the most proud of because everybody was like, yeah, I come up and ski here and snowboard and mountain bike. I never thought to bring my gravel bike and just go explore. And people have spent so much time on the 395 and just never really thought about those roads that are out there. So that part to me was very rewarding. I think Visit Mammoth now knows that it is a really great destination to for people to go bring a gravel bike and explore. And that part, I think, will be the thing we'll, we'll always be the most proud of is kind of sharing that adventurous spirit up there. Yeah. Did you think about the event from like, um, you want this to be a hyper competitive event? Or was it something else in your mind when you conceived of it? Mm, that's it. That's kind of hard for me because I am so competitive. So we wanted this fine balance of making everybody feel like they were competing for something. Um, because I don't want to exclude all of those people. Like I always appreciated that Sam aims with the rock cobbler he was always like this isn't a race but two people are going to win like he's always said that and he's always acknowledged me or whoever else was winning those years but he didn't like do categories for all you know the age groups and whatnot but re I really wanted to do that for our event because as a swimmer as a triathlete having those goals for everyday regular people was something that was important to me because it was important to me a decade ago before I got into anything super competitive. So I think it's important to reward, um, yeah, the people that are doing the thing and going how they can as fast as they can for their certain categories, I think is still important to me. Um, but in that sense, I also just want to make sure people can come and have a good time and not feel like the pressure to, to perform. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like you've covered both bases, right? You've, you've, you, you've allowed the racer types to go at it, go hard and get some recognition at the end, but you've also built that safety net to make sure that 
there's no man or woman left behind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I wanted to touch on that seems like it's been growing in your portfolio of gravel offerings has been the camps. What, can you just tell me about like what a tough camp is like and what are tough, what's the vision for 2023? Yeah, yeah. I, I will go, as, I'm going to go a decade back real quick. So when I was, uh, I finished my master's degree in 2012 and I had planned a trip to Europe with my best friend from high school and we signed up for one of those like VIP experiences with the Tour de France. And so we did like this, like 10 days in the Pyrenees sort of thing and blew all of the money that I'd made in college to go do this trip. Cause I was like, whatever, I'm starting work after this. Like I can make money later. And it was like a very, I don't know, transformative, life-changing trip that we did. And I think, you know, the the people I had spent a week with, I still talk to today. And I think that experience was important for me because it made me realize how much like travel and sharing cool experiences on two wheels was to me. And then, you know, shortly after that, I met David, I was working at Felt, all of these things kind of stumbled into bike racing and bike racing became the catalyst to going cool places and riding bikes with friends and then now I am like moving that pendulum sort of back into to what was really important to me 10 years ago which was like just going and doing these trips and riding with people for fun and like sharing kind of all of the experiences that I've had in the past decade so that was the impetus of it. And like, I knew we were going to have this conversation. And I was thinking a lot about why I wanted to do camps and why they were so important to me. And Dave working as a coach for Carmichael Training Systems, like they have always done a really amazing job with camps. And I've had the pleasure of helping coach some of those and being a part of them. And every time I'm like, this is where it's at. Like the like intimate, like group setting, you know, you have good food, you hang out, you just talk about important life stuff. Like that I think was always something I enjoyed. So that was the impetus of, of all of it. We started some of the camps in 2020, a couple more in 2021, a couple more last year and to where we are at today, making all of them sort of under the tough ventures umbrella and expanding it to a couple of camps in Kansas. Super cool. I do I do think for many cyclists the idea of a camp evokes this training camp mentality, which is like, oh, I'm going because I'm trying to do well at Unbound or what yeah. have you. And I think it's an inter really interesting opportunity to kind of shift that mindset to more what you're saying, which is like, I'm gonna go somewhere cool. I'm gonna ride my ass off for four days. I'm not doing that for it necessarily for anything beyond the sheer pleasure of riding for four days and getting access to people who are knowledgeable about the sport and learning a thing or two. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a middle ground of a training camp and like a vacation trip because <laughs> I want I want to bring value. And the way I've been explaining it to everyone is like, Dave and I made a lot of mistakes in the past 10 years. We did everything the wrong way. And I would like to make sure that people coming into this discipline now kind of learn from our mistakes, start doing everything the right way, because you will have a much more pleasant experience doing these long adventures. If you have, you know, some, some semblance of like how you should take care of yourself essentially. Yeah, definitely. There's just a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of if someone just tells you something simple, like make sure you eat every hour in these long events. Yeah. You're going to yeah. be a lot better off than Or some than people that are like, that. oh man, I only had a bottle in four hours. I'm like, well, that's why you feel like crap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, like you, had the benefit of doing triathlons where you sort of learn those lessons very quickly. If you yeah. didn't fuel in one activity for the next one, you were pretty much hosed. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, again, one of the other things that happened was we had so many people that came to Mammoth and did the short route last year, and it was like their first gravel event. And that was very intimidating for me because I was like, this is going to be like their introduction to this experience and this discipline. And I wanted it to be good. And I wanted them to have resources at their disposal to make it comfortable so much so, I feel like I over-delivered and over-shared on some of that information. 
and I had a couple people emailing me and say like, you know, you don't really have to like handhold so much for all these people. I was like, yeah, I do because some of them literally have no idea. So like, if it's annoying to you that I'm telling you to drink a bottle an hour, like just ignore me then. (laughs) This isn't for you. (laughs) (laughs) So most of the camps, well, all the camps last year were up at Mammoth and obviously like just being able to showcase all the great trails and roads up at Mammoth was an obvious thing for you to do both in terms of getting people pumped about that region that you love so much and getting people excited maybe specifically for your event. But now you're expanding to Kansas. Let's talk about like, what's the orientation of those camps in Kansas? Is it just yet another great place to ride that people should go? Or is it trying to get you ready for any particular event? Uh, yeah, yeah. They So the first one is with the Flint Hills Gravel Ride, and the second one in July is with the Rock Ridge Gravel. And so both of those events are run by Bobby Thompson. And Dave and I met Bobby like way back in 2017. The Dirty Kansas Production or Promotion Company was the company that was that DK was under at the time. And they had dabbled in this idea of travel trips as well. So they did this like test run to do the Dirty River in the UK. And Bobby was on that trip. So we met Bobby in that like travel trip bike thing atmosphere. And we became really fast, good friends. And they had come out to Mammoth a couple times um, in 2020 or 2021 and 2022. So we have always had this relationship with Bobby and he wanted to build his camps or sorry his events in Kansas that were more of like grassroots like OG gravel style there and that's very much the stuff that Dave and I fell in love with and we were like well let's see if we can do tough camps in Kansas because Bobby came to me and said like hey I'm not getting enough women signing up for these like what am I doing wrong and I was like well I don't think you're doing anything wrong necessarily I think just like what you're offering is still intimidating for women so let's try and maybe bring this camp idea to to soften that experience or make it feel more palatable for women and for anyone as a whole. Um, so that was where that idea came from to build those camps there. And obviously I have a really good reputation and love for that area in terms of what I've been able to do um, with Unbound and all of the experience that Dave and I have with that event. So I think sharing what we know and doing that and again in a place that uh, means a lot to us was kind of why we wanted to do it so will those camps actually culminate in participation in the those events yeah so that's how we structured it was like a three day leading up to that event so that that final day you get to sort of execute everything that you've learned in the three days prior which is which is a fun way to do it yeah that's super interesting I want to touch on something that you mentioned offline, but just kind of reference there about just finding a way to bring more female athletes into the sport. And you mentioned some work you were doing with Sam at Rock Cobbler this year. Can you describe what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. So Chris Hull was on the marketing team helping Sam out this year, and he sent me a message a couple months ago and was like, hey, Sam's at like 16% female participation. And he was like, how do we make that bigger? I'm not happy with it. And I was like, yeah, I'm not happy with that either. That's not a great number. So I was like, well, let's, you know, open 50 spots on the back end for any women that want to sign up after it sells out. And I was like, I will volunteer my time if people want to ask me any questions about it, if they're nervous, because maybe women don't necessarily want to email Sam or an unknown face behind an event and say like, Hey, is this for me? Maybe they'll feel more comfortable if it's for me. So they put a whole special section of the website called ask Panda and people could email me their questions if they were concerned about stuff. And we got quite a few people that emailed and women that were just uncomfortable or didn't feel great about doing the short distance because it it didn't feel like enough or they felt like a failure because they wanted to do the pebbler And it was very eye-opening in the sense that I was like, yeah, maybe just women need that safe space to be able to say, hey, I'm uncomfortable, and they need somebody to tell them, like, it's going to be okay, and you are fully capable of doing this. Or maybe you're not fully capable, and it's okay to do this other part of it instead. You know, it was um, 
yeah, again, just a very eye-opening thing because women traditionally can just have a lot more self-doubt, I think, than men. And that idea that they perhaps might not feel like it's a space or a discipline that's for them necessarily. So the more that I can try and crack that code on making women feel like they're more capable, I think that that's something that I'd like to to focus on in the future. Yeah, I think that's super cool takeaway for a lot of event organizers listening. It's just like, find a female athlete that can be supportive and be open to questions like that just to make people feel welcome. Yeah, yeah. It seems so simple, but really like, and again, a lot of that has, has stemmed from talking to other women or like even my best friend, the one that I was talking to that we went to Europe together, I always kind of use her as my litmus test of like, like a better representation of all women in terms of how they're looking at this stuff. And she'll always second guess herself or say like, I don't think I can do that. And most of the times it's because I feel like she's comparing it maybe to things that I do or things that she sees other women do these like epic things. And she's like, yeah, that's not for me. I'm like, no, it is like, you have no idea that you are fully capable of doing this if you want to. And a lot of times they, they won't even take the step to do it because they're unsure. So the more that I can help, like, no, you can do it. If you want to do it, you should do X, Y, Z to, to get there. Um, yeah, those conversations I think are so important. And for men listening to this too, you all have also a responsibility, I think, in to like make your female friends feel comfortable because a lot of times like women just are too afraid to ask or they think that their questions are stupid. So the more that men, dads especially, um, brothers, the more that you all can make your female counterparts more comfortable, I think the better off we'll all be because it's not necessarily my job only either. <laughs> I think it's everyone's job to to make it to make it feel like something that they can do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for doing that, by the way. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. You've got a busy calendar of your own activities, but are there any events for the rest of the year that you're excited about doing? Oh. I don't know. I sort of don't, I don't really, I don't think I have anything. I was like super excited about Rock Cobbler and I even just did the short one this year. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm putting all of my eggs in the, the camp and mammoth basket and really focusing on Caldera because it is something that has a steep learning curve. Like obviously I have I haven't finished it twice. So there's a reason why and it's just a lot of like learning things the hard way I think when it comes to bikepacking so the idea of like even more self-sufficiency than I've been used to in the past is the like that learning thing that I'm most excited about for this year is was that the if you could point to like the reasons why you haven't been able to complete the route or is it a self-sufficiency issue I would say it's equipment, <laughs> honestly, like the, well, the first year I couldn't even start it because of wildfires. So that was, that was a whole nother thing. And then the yeah. second time I got stuck in like a lightning storm and on top of that, my knee was bugging me because I had picked a, I had made wrong equipment decisions essentially. And it's something yeah. where, you know, if I'm used to a certain position, riding style, and I have so many hours in that same position, I was jumping into something different more weight on my bike more everything more walking yeah. <laughs> so it's just the yeah a learning curve of equipment and how i need to manage like i don't know just a very different style of goal chasing essentially yeah it's so it's so different i mean yeah. just 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 having a loaded bike in and of itself is like a game changer and what, how your knees feel in particular. Exactly. Exactly. Cause I, so I had like a frame bag on my frame. And so I thought, well, I'll make my Q factor wider so that my knees aren't rubbing my frame. And that Q factor thing just royally effed up my left knee. <laughs> that was the thing that ultimately did me in was changing one thing that I thought was going to help me. But really like your bodies are so fine tuned to a certain feel that if you throw that off and you're trying to do it for five days in a row, like forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And cycling because of the repetitive nature of it, it's like you get something wrong. It, you're doing it over and over and over and over and over again. Eventually it's going to add up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just 
again, stupid things where if I was telling somebody, I would say like, yeah, nothing new on race day. That's like one of my main mantras. And I, of course, like I did something different for this major goal that I shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> something that was even harder than race day, arguably. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm super excited for all the camps. I think for anybody listening, like that is a good way to spend four days. And yeah. I love that Mammoth Tough went off well, and I'm excited for you guys doing it again. And obviously I'll put um, a link in the show notes to registration, which just opened up. So people listening, make sure to go out and grab your spot. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. I think, and for anybody that's listening to this, that do- hasn't listened to a bunch of the the gravel ride episodes, go back and listen to the one that Craig did with Trek Travel in Girona and just be inspired to go to go do a fun bike trip because I think yeah I'm I'm really gonna push that more for a lot of people who are you know race or event anxious and just need like need a good reason to go explore and do it in a different way yeah gravel travel it's where it's at yes exactly (laughs) (laughs) so good to spend some time with you again and hopefully we catch up later this year yeah thanks craig i appreciate it that's going to do it for this week's edition of the gravel ride podcast i hope you enjoyed that conversation with amanda as much as i did she's such a great member of the gravel cycling community i always learn a lot listening to the grodio podcast and appreciate her perspective She's been doing all these gravel events for a while, so just offers a great historical view as to what it was like, what it's like now, and what are some of the ways that we can chart the course forward. I encourage you to check out all the Tough Ventures work. It's tough.ventures. As she mentioned during the show, they're doing the Mammoth Tough event, but they're also doing a series of camps this year, which I think will be super fun and informative to anybody who can attend. If you're interested in connecting with me, I encourage you to join The Ridership. That's www.theridership.com. If you're able to support the show, please visit buymeacoffee.com slash thegravelride, or ratings and reviews are hugely appreciated. Until next time, here's to finding some dirt under your wheels.